So welcome to Good Vibrations to Jay Widener. Good to have you along today, Jay. Hey, thanks for uh, inviting me. Okay. Uh, now, your biog describes you as a filmmaker, researcher, author, and hermetic scholar. And I feel a really good introduction to what you're all about and what you get into is the three laws of the universe that are posted on your website. Uh, these are great. The first one says, whatever ideas are the most suppressed are most likely to be closest to the truth. I can certainly relate to that. Uh, the second one, which I've actually used in some of my public talks, because it's a great one, is if a picture is worth a thousand words, then a symbol is worth a thousand pictures. I get into the symbols that are placed in music videos and uh, record industry uh, sleeves and promo pictures and stuff and what, what's being communicated there. And then the third one says the only people that call conspiracies theories are the conspirators. I love those. They're great. <laughs> I haven't heard him for a while. <laughs> yeah, that, that that's a good introduction to uh, what you're all about, I feel. Yeah, I think you're right. <laughs> right, I want to talk today about the most fascinating of all the film directors, because a lot of the content of this guy's movies tie into so much else that we get into in the Good Vibration series. It encompasses the conspiratorial to the spiritual and the esoteric and, you know, the unknown generally. We're talking about Stanley Kubrick, uh, and you're an authority on Kubrick. I've always loved his films, and there's always been something about them that, that's drawn me in, uh, even before I kind of woke up, so to speak. And I've always been captivated by 2001, A Space Odyssey, from an early age. Never really knew why. Uh, so my interest... My interest was uh, piqued by your work, Kubrick's Odyssey, uh, which you came out with a few years ago, and your analysis of the symbolism and possible alternative meanings to a lot of Kubrick's movies. Um, so to get into the guy uh, generally, just a bit, I know it's well-worn territory for you, but it seems there's evidence to suggest that Kubrick was privy to the elite's sort of globalist's master plan for humanity, and that he encoded a lot of this into his films. Would you go along with that? Yeah, I think he was. Um, I think he was taken into a secret society or the secret society, whatever, uh, in the mid '60s, around 1965, maybe '64, uh, and uh, he was brought in to be primarily a serviceman for the elites to make films and to help them out with certain projects, especially the Apollo moon landings. Uh, and um, through that interaction, he probably participated in some of the events that take place in the film Eyes Wide Shut. Yeah. And um, I think this is why he built the biggest state at St. Albans outside of London with the big walls. Um, he was very paranoid, as uh, aides tell me. And um, he would drive around in a golf cart um, looking for intruders. And um, he was just that kind of guy. And he, he masked his secrets in the films, I think, believing that the secrets wouldn't get out for 30 or 40 years after he died. Uh, unfortunately, I came along and started unraveling them almost right away. Well, and, someone uh, was going to do it eventually. Yeah. And... Um, and, you know, I, I hope I haven't put, you know, his wife Christiana at risk or his daughter at risk, Vivian. Um, they, um, you know, are both uh, uh, watching what I'm doing with great interest, I know. And uh, so, um, you know, I think that was Stanley's big concern was that these secrets would stay secret until long after his family had gone. Unfortunately, I thought it was too um, important to uh, let the secrets linger. And, um, and then, of course, I knew about The Shining in 2006, but I didn't release the information again until late 2009 for the same reasons. And now it's becoming part of the culture. Uh, there's a rock group called Imagine Dragons who has a big hit called On Top of the World. Their video is now 13 million hits, and it features Stanley faking the moon landings. The hottest screenplay in Hollywood right now, hottest unsold screenplay in Hollywood right now, is called 1969, A Space Odyssey, which is all about the story that Stanley went through faking the moon landings. So now this has gone from a conspiracy theory to um, into the culture. And I think that it's going to get very interesting very soon. 
And when it comes into uh, Kubrick's understanding that there was an elite ruling class, uh, the Illuminati, some choose to call them, do you feel that that's something that he wanted to be a part of because he saw himself as one of the elites and, you know, a step above the, the average guy in the street? Or do you think as time went on, he came to be a little bit shocked and maybe uh, repulsed by what they stood for and he kind of rebelled against it? Is there anything to suggest what his attitude was towards this? elite class well i mean nothing that we can take that is you know outside of his films but i think if you take his films as a whole um you can see that he's definitely commenting on them and he does not like them it's pretty clear yeah. i think he was taken into the uh, illuminati or whatever you want to call it uh, when he uh, decided to uh, help them fake the Apollo moon landings in early 1964, uh, they offered him the chance of uh, unlimited uh, ability to make any film he wanted, something that no filmmaker has ever had before or after. Not even Spielberg has that kind of power. And um, I think that he, you know, he was like the kid in the candy store at first. Yes. But I think he began to understand what the elites were really doing by, I believe, 1966, 67. I believe that when he changed the title from Journey to the Stars to 2001 A Space Odyssey, that was the turning point when he realized that the elites were not good people and are actually evil people. Right. And he wanted to make sure that the year 2001 was indelibly stamped into our heads so that when 2001 came along and the elites did their ultimate ritual murder, that we would remember his film. Yeah, yeah. It's always struck me as beyond coincidence that 2001, being such a, an incredible deep film, uh, happened to reference the year in which we had 9-11, which has led to so many changes in human society and, you know, has caused so many people to wake up to their true nature as well, conversely. Uh, it's all about 2001. It's all in the numbers, I feel. It is, and it should be pointed out that I think it's World Trade Center building number six is all or was it's gone now was almost in the same exact dimensions as the black monolith so one of the buildings within the world trade center looks like the looked like the black monolith well yeah yeah and when you get into 9 11 research uh many researchers will tell you that that event was planned decades in advance so it's perfectly plausible that in the 1960s there was full knowledge of what was to come all those years later they do tend to plan ahead well that's very interesting because um freeman fry who's an american conspiracy theorist interviewed the guy who was the assistant to the architect of the World Trade Center, and he claims that he was told in 1967, 68, when they were planning on building it, that they put the explosions in the building while they were being built. Yeah. And did this because there would be no other way to really bring down the building, so they had to do it while it was being built. What's interesting about this is that there is a Get Smart program called The Walls of Jericho Come Tumbling Down. This is a, a mid-60s television show that was produced and written by Mel Brooks, who lived in the village about three blocks away from Stanley Kubrick at the same exact time. And um, in this episode, uh, the uh, good guys who are called Control, Maxwell Smart works for them, the, he's called in... Uh, to infiltrate a building contracting company whose buildings, after they're built, fall apart and blow up and fall apart. And so Max is sent to the construction site. The building is called the Odyssey that's being built, and it's um, going to house the U.S. space program. And so this is why it's so vitally important to make sure that the building doesn't come down. Mm -hmm. So Max infiltrates the building, and the contractor, and he discovers the blueprints in this show that's written by Mel Brooks, and he discovers that they're planting the explosives in the building while it's being built, exactly what the architect of the World Trade Center said. Yeah. This is 1967. The um, Port Authority has just approved the construction of the World Trade Center. We know from the... Um, 
I believe it's called the Let's Roll Forums, which was a very good forum on 9-11. We know now that the World Trade Center really was not occupied at all, hardly, during its 30 years that it was up, and uh, which is odd and strange. Only the... Um, only the businesses near the ground were occupied. The building was largely empty the entire time until about two years before it went down when suddenly they started putting leases and getting people into the buildings. Interestingly enough, a lot of the companies that signed those leases and entered, those, entered into the building in 96, 97 are closely associated with the defense establishment. Uh, and the economic establishment, uh, Solomon Smith Barney and others. Hmm. So um, what I'm suggesting is that possibly both Kubrick and Brooks, because of their associations with the New York mob, um, may have found out about the ritual way ahead of time and uh, tried to warn us, both in this episode of Get Smart and in 2001 Space Odyssey. Yeah. Kubrick chose a different path. Instead of telling anyone what he knew, he tried to wake us up in 1968 mm. with his movie. Uh, kind of try to get ahead of the event is what I believe. Yeah, fascinating. And we're going to get into Saturn in a while and the influence of Saturn and Saturn symbolism and all of that. But staying with 2001, uh, we've got the black monolith, of course, that iconic motif of the movie. And it's being discovered on the moon and it's acting as a sort of transmitter of a signal to some form of higher intelligence out in deep space. Uh, it's highly resonant given what a lot of researchers have to say now about the true nature of the moon uh, being an artificial construct and, and also the seeding of humanity by some extraterrestrial force in the remote past, whether you go with what Sitchin has to say about it or Von Daniken or any of these other researchers. Very interesting stuff to look at the parallels in the movie. And of course... In the movie, the signal from the moon ends up getting beamed to Jupiter. But in the original screenplay, it was Saturn, which is very interesting. Uh, why do you think the planet in the narrative was changed from Jupiter to Saturn? Uh, sorry, from Saturn to Jupiter. Yeah, it's, it's in the book that's written by Clark and Kubrick, the novel. It still maintains its Saturn. In fact, it's even more interesting. It's a moon of Saturn is where the monolith is, and that moon is Iapetus. And if anyone is familiar with Richard Hoagland's work on Iapetus, if you aren't, then go right now to it and look at it, because it's a stunning. It is obviously Iapetus. It's an artificial construct. And so I find it very interesting you know, in the early 60s, two Soviet scientists whose names has now escaped me, I wouldn't be able to pronounce them anyway, uh, came out with a theory that the moon was constructed and it was artificial and that it was brought here. Uh, and uh, their, their evidence is incredibly compelling and I can't hardly believe that Kubrick didn't know about all of this evidence. Yeah. In fact, I think they did know about it. I think the Lunar Orbiter series in 66 and 67 came back and showed the artificial nature of the moon. Yeah. So it's, it's interesting that in the book and the screenplay, original screenplay, the signal, the monolith is found on an artificial construct, i.e. the moon, and it sends a signal to another monolith, which is on Iapetus, another obvious construct, um, uh, you know, as a moon of Saturn. Yeah. And, and uh, then we get into the lore of Saturn, and we begin to really wonder what's going on. But Kubrick claims that his special effects department could not make the rings believable enough, yeah. so he switched it to Jupiter. Now, that's believable, except for the fact that his special effects department was second to none. Yeah. And it seems kind of hard to believe that they couldn't do it. Well, absolutely. I personally believe that the um, Illuminati, the powers that be, read Clark and Kubrick's script, of course, and saw the Saturn part. Yeah. And said, no, no, you're, you're not going to. A little too close for comfort, that original yeah. script. Yeah, and, you know, when we understand that the the German scientists that came here on Operation Paperclip were part of this German Saturnian society 
um, that had been around since Hitler's days, or if not earlier. We know that the Skull and Bones, which came to America from Germany uh, to Yale University, is also a Saturnian kind of cult. And um, uh, Troy McLaughlin has done some really good work on this. Yeah. I highly recommend his work. And uh, so, you know, this kind of put me into the research mode of going and looking at Saturn and what it was. And, you know, I came to the conclusion that Saturn is not what we think it is. Yeah. And um, I don't know what it is. I just know it's not what we think it is. The hexagonal uh, vortex pattern at the North Pole really bothers me. The clouds going and making uh, curves, you know, and, uh, and making a perfect hexagon. And then, of course, the big, huge eye that sits at the South Pole of Saturn uh, you know, also uh, worries me a little bit. So I don't know what Saturn is. Um, some people think it's a stargate that allows um, uh, extraterrestrials and humans maybe to come in and out of our galaxy or our solar system, excuse me. Uh, I don't know, but I know that the secret society that Kubrick was part of worships Saturn. Yeah. And, and Kubrick was trying to tell us something very deep in 2001 about the link that we have with Saturn and the link that the people or creatures who farmed us have with Saturn. Yeah. It seems to be the case with most of Kubrick's movies that you have a sort of surface narrative which purports to be the film's raison d'etre. You know, uh, this is a film about such and such as far as the cinema-going public would see it. But when you start digging beneath the surface, you can find all kinds of symbolism and alternative meanings encoded into the, the fabric of it. Uh, yeah, what I find is that when Kubrick changes something from the original material, the original source material, that's when you have to wake up. Yeah. When he, when he changes the planet from Saturn to Jupiter, wake up. Yeah, something's going on. He, yeah, when he makes, uh, at the end of the book, Clockwork Orange by Anthony Burgess, um, um, uh, the mind control just kind of eventually fades away, and Alex is able to return back to his old life. But in the movie, Kubrick has the government rework his brain so that he can become a psychopath again. And I find that extremely revealing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and then, of course, there's The Shining, where whenever he changes from the Stephen King novel, he's actually confessing to doing the moon landing. Oh, yeah. And this is on and on, all the way up to Eyes Wide Shut. So, yeah, that's, that's what you look for in a Kubrick movie, is when he does something, changes something from the source material. Yeah, I didn't find too much in Barry Lyndon, actually. <laughs> Couldn't really find nope. any hidden meaning there. Actually, Barry Lyndon is an interesting film. Uh, I find it to be actually be one of his most boring movies. But um, besides the fact that its music is beautiful and, and the photography is second to none, and so are the, um, the pieces, the uh, set pieces are beautiful, period pieces. And the fact that he shot the movie with the uh, cameras that he was given freely by NASA also is a red flag. But Barry Lyndon is really, I think, Kubrick's show of his disgust with the elites. And um, three times, let me get this straight, one, two, yeah, three times in Kubrick films, we can see that um, the character uh, that is being in uh, that is in these three films is trying to achieve something, trying to join the elites in a way. And in all three cases, uh, he finds out the hero finds out the pro and the protagonist finds out that in fact he will never be part of the elite. He can at best only be a worker for the elite. Yep. And those three films are Barry Lyndon. Barry tries to get into the elites, and then he's stopped. Um, and The Shining, Jack Nicholson yep. wants to get in with the beautiful people who live in the gold room. Yep. But again, he finds out that he's really just a caretaker. And, and then the uh, Tom Cruise character. And then the Tom Cruise character who thinks that he's getting into the elites, but really finds out he's just the house doctor. Yeah. Uh, an interesting, one, one of Kubrick's most interesting films to me has always been Dr. Strangelove. Uh, because there we have 
popular conspiracy theories being explored as far back as 1964. Uh, I recall there's the Sterling Hayden character claiming that the water is is being poisoned. No, strip us of our bo- uh, uh, pure bodily fluids. Essence. Yeah, it, bodily fluids are pure essence. Exactly, he's going on about that. And then in Lolita in 1962, you've got the question of paedophilia uh, being discussed, of course, albeit yep. albeit in a very covert way. Um, but yeah, Doctor Strangelove is is a fascinating one. And you've got the Peter Sellers uh, character, the German uh, Doctor Strangelove of the character, who to me has always borne a very uncanny resemblance to Henry Kissinger. And uh, you've got this interesting idea of a German doctor being consulted in this underground bunker at a time of war. And there's got to be some overtones there to Operation Paperclip. Uh, It's all dressed up as as satire, of course. But for those that really have an understanding of what's going on, there's some very interesting stuff in Strangelove, isn't there? Oh, there is. Uh, And uh, just as an aside, um, that uh, little uh, speech that uh, General Ripper gives about water is um, astonishingly prescient because uh, we know they started fluoridating the water, at least in the United States in the 50s, and there was a huge uh, outcry against it. I remember I was a little kid and I couldn't figure out what these uh, um, pamphlets that were stuffed in my mailbox claiming that you know some criminal cabal was going to poison our water I was like five years old. I'm like, what is going on here? Hmm. And um, and now we know, of course, that fluoridation calcifies the pineal gland. We also know from alchemy that the pineal gland is the third eye and the source of immortality. We also know from studies in Princeton University in the 80s uh, that they removed the pineal gland of, from old rats and replaced them with young pineal gl- glands, and the rats, the old rats, got younger. And when they put old pineal glands in young rats, the rats suddenly got older. So we know that the entire barometer of the aging process is the pineal gland. Yeah. So the question of alchemy becomes: Okay, how do we stop the pineal gland from getting calcified? And the uh, alchemists, you know, came up with, uh, I'm getting to Dr. Strangelove, just bear with me here. The alchemists came up with three kinds of ways that you could decalcify the pineal gland. One, and it all boils down to drinking distilled water. Yep. What distilled water does is it sucks all the non-organic minerals out of the body. Some uh, health people think that this is really bad for you. I contend that this is the best thing that could ever happen to you because, A, you're decalcifying your pineal gland. B, you're stripping all of the plaque that's all over your arteries and veins that causes heart attacks. Uh, C, you're stripping the plaque out of your aorta, out of your brain. Uh, uh, even off the the teeth, the plaque on the teeth goes away if you start drinking distilled water. And so I came to the conclusion, you know, months and months ago that distilled water was the secret to alchemy. And then I was watching, rewatching for about the 500th time, my favorite war film, Dr. Strangelove. And there's General Ripper played by the great actor Sterling Hayden. And there he is saying that the fluoridation is going to destroy us. It's going to destroy our precious bodily fluids. Yeah. And he only drinks pure rainwater, which is one of the only ways that you can get distilled water. There's only three ways to get distilled water. One is rainwater or two. Two is a kind of nauseating one, which is drinking your own urine. <laughs> and three is laboratory distillation. These are the three main subjects of alchemy. And here in Dr. Strangelove, whether he knew it or not, Stanley Kubrick is revealing the secret of alchemy. So I don't know if he knew it or not, but it still is astonishing. Um, So Dr. Strangelove also deviates from the book Red Alert that the source material is from. And all of those deviations are... um, are revealing the secret workings of our government, whether it be the uh, Operation Paperclip scientists, uh, uh, played by Peter Sellers, brilliantly played by Peter Sellers, by the way, or um, whether it be uh, the underground bunkers that they're planning to put people in after uh, after the end of the world. 
Uh, the secret war room was a secret at that time. Kubrick reveals it. The Pentagon was actually really pissed off that he revealed that there was a war room. Um, how Kubrick knew there was a war room is a head scratcher, actually. So you look at all this stuff and you realize that um, Kubrick is releasing a lot of information that heretofore had been secret. Oh, you know, yeah. Yeah. 60 and this got him the job doing the moon landings, I want to say, because the Pentagon saw the film and were completely blown away by the interiors of the B-52. Uh, James Earl Jones, by the way, is the guy who was sitting there and uh, operating the bombing. And uh, the outside shots of the B-52 going over Siberia were stunning. And nothing in cinema had been anything like that up to that time. Mm. Yeah, it's amazing what he's revealing. Uh, and you think, you know, this is 50 years ago. We're going back uh, 50 years and all these great secrets, which people are just getting uh, s some awareness of now, were being discussed back then. And I guess the elites or the studio bosses were just reliant on the cinema going public at the time, taking the film at face value, seeing it as a bit of a, a jolly romp, a bit of a satire, and not imagining that there could be anything... Uh, other than a, a fairly far-fetched plot going on uh, in front of their eyes. Yeah, Kubrick left time bombs, I call them, yeah. in his films yeah. that were meant to explode many, many years later. That's right. And um, and, and he did it on purpose, uh, uh, and, he, and he wanted it to be like this. You have to understand that this is not an accident. These are not, you know, coincidences. This is hmm. this was thought up. The guy had a 200 IQ. He was a chess champion. He could have been the next Kasparov. He was that good. Uh, he would play f uh, eight games in the village uh, at once and win all eight games against top chess players in New York City. Um, he could have been anything he wanted to be. Uh, instead, you know, he decided to make films. And the reason he decided to make films is because films are infinitely guaranteed to never, uh, you could never, how do I say this right? You could never fully comprehend the filmmaking process as a single person. It is too big of an endeavor from everything from lighting to uh, camera to acting to story to costumes. It is a huge endeavor. I know because I'm a filmmaker and I think that Kubrick got into films and filmmaking because he had a low threshold for boredom. Mm. And you will never get bored making films, I guarantee it. Oh, Although yeah. I think he was starting to get bored with Barry Lyndon, which is why he made The Shining. I believe that the difference between Barry Lyndon in 1974 and The Shining in 1980 is a renewed vigor from Stanley uh, as far as filmmaking is concerned. And what he tried to do with The Shining, besides it being a confession of him doing the moon landings, um, The Shining is, uh, as I like to say, it's like uh, playing three-dimensional chess. It is uh, almost unbelievably difficult to comprehend the number of layers going on in The Shining. Um, and we're still finding layers. Uh, researchers are. There's a great film, which I invite you all to see. Uh, I'm in it. It's called Room 237. Yep. Which into some of the theories behind The Shining. Rodney Asher, the filmmaker, left out some of the more wild uh, theories uh, that I turned him on to. And I don't blame him. They're pretty crazy. But uh, there's a lot more to The Shining than it's even in that movie. Oh, yeah. Let's get on to The Shining in a second. Um, it is interesting that in 2001, you've got the black monolith being discovered on the moon and beaming the signal out to, to deep space. And the idea was that uh, this would act as a kind of time capsule. And it's only when humanity had developed... Uh, a certain degree of intelligence to be able to travel to the moon and you know excavate the thing that uh, this acted as an indication that humanity was ready for this next level of its development and it's the same kind of idea being explored in Kubrick's movies really isn't it that uh, we're talking about things now 50 years later that were encoded into Doctor Strange Love in 2001 and it seems in a way that humanity is only ready now to kind of understand some of these ideas that Kubrick was encoding 50 years years ago because we've got this awakening going on we've got people paying so much attention now to what's really going on in the world and the nature of reality and what we're doing here these questions are being asked and it's only now that we're ready to understand these things it seems 
Well, that is a really, really great observation. Um, yeah, because the, the secret that I discovered in 2001, which I consider to be the one of the biggest secrets of the film, which I discovered in 1999, right after Stanley died, was that the film, uh, the uh, the projected film on the screen, is actually the same exact dimensions as the monolith itself. In other words, the center. Uh, cinesc- cinescope screen is exactly the same dimensions as the black monolith. Hmm. So therefore, the film is the black monolith. Therefore, the film, like the black monolith, can sit for many, many, many years with no one being able to understand what it says. Yeah. But when we finally touch the film the way that you're supposed to touch the film, then the secrets begin to be revealed. And I really think 2001 is the mother load because if you, once you learn how to decipher the symbols in 2001, then deciphering the rest of Stanley Kubrick's films becomes a lot easier. Mm. Uh, you're, it's sort of like you're allowed permission. Uh, to do uh, an interpretation of the other films once you've cracked 2001. So I think that it, it is the key. I believe 2001 is the, um, in, in a way, the keystone of his career. I think he had a career before 2001, which was one kind of career. Hmm. And then I had, think he had a career after 2001 that was another kind of career. Yeah. And the films that are in, uh, starting with 2001, going all the way to Eyes Wide Shut and should have gone all the way to Artificial Intelligence, were revealing a step-by-step, it was a step-by-step revelation with each film playing an integral part in this revelation. Unfortunately, the final aspect of the revelation, which was going to be a one-two punch with Eyes Wide Shut and AI, was aborted. And so we'll never really be able to follow his stream of thought all the way to the end, yeah. which is really unfortunate. Yeah, that's pretty tragic. Just as a bit of a wild card before we move on, do you think Peter Sellers' mad German doctor in Doctor Strangelove was modelled on Henry Kissinger? He does look like him. Well, I mean, it, w- it would make sense. Kissinger was hanging with the Rockefellers at the time, and uh, they were telling everyone that he was the up-and-coming guy. Of course, uh, Nelson Rockefeller introduced him to uh, Nixon, and the rest is history. Mm. Um, I think I think it could have been, yeah. I think that everybody in the movie is based on something on somebody. Um, the uh, George C. Scott is playing. Now I'm going to space his name out. The crazy uh, general who wanted to uh, bomb Russia. I forget his name. It was a French name. Um, he, he definitely is playing that guy. Hmm. And, uh, you know, so, you know, yeah, I, I, I do believe that. I, I believe that um, Dr. Strangelove, uh, oh, and another, another point that needs to be talked about is the fact that in the book, Lolita, the Peter Sellers character is a dentist. But in the movie, Lolita, we don't know what he is. He's a high school teacher. Is he a Hollywood producer? Uh, and then if you go into his mansion, which uh, James Mason does at the beginning, at the end of the movie, mm. you see all sorts of illuminist stuff sitting all around this disheveled mansion that Peter Sellers is living in. Uh, and, 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 and also in the movie Lolita, as opposed to the book, Peter Sellers and his odd lady friend, who's not in the book, are are implying that they work for a pedophile group Mm. and that trying to bring lolita into that group it's Mm. pretty clear actually yeah it's amazing and as you say the clues are all in the changes that are made from the original uh book or screenplay that, that there's so much revealed there so uh just moving on then and bringing in The Shining, the crux of your Kubrick's Odyssey documentary was to explore the idea that Kubrick was, in fact, the director in charge of the faked Apollo moon landings in 1969, which is when I was conceived, incidentally, yeah. um, uh, during the Apollo moon landing, so I'm told. Uh, and the, pr- the production design on 2001 was, in part, a preparation for the faked footage that Kubrick would go on to direct and 
this would be presented to the world as proof that NASA had gone to the moon. And you go on to suggest that Kubrick wrestled with his conscience for many years afterwards over what he'd done. And he went on to encode his involvement symbolically into The Shining years later in 1980 when it came out. And as you point out, this is the basis of your involvement with Room 237, where you put this theory across. Uh, and, and this has been pretty much your major work over the last few years, hasn't it, in, in, um, in yeah. Kubrick? Yeah, it has. Um, so, you know, basically, you know, I had the proof that front screen projection was used in the Apollo photographs. Um, I had the proof that Stanley Kubrick was the greatest front screen projection artist, uh, the ape scenes in 2001 being the greatest example of front screen projection. Um, I had proof that uh, all of the top heads of NASA were going to London and visiting Stanley on the set of 2001. I had proof that the head technical advisor for 2001 was also the guy who was heading up uh, the Apollo program, Dr. Fred Ordway. I had Arthur C. Clarke, his um, co-screenwriter, uh, hanging with Herman Oberth, one of the father of the German space program. With Werner von Braun, Oberth stayed at, uh, at Clark's apartment in London on his way to um, Alabama to join the uh, Apollo or the NASA. Um, I had uh, the lenses that NASA gave to Kubrick to do Barry Lyndon. I mean, I had a lot of ancillary evidence, but I did not have a smoking gun. I still don't have a smoking gun. However, the closest thing that I have to a smoking gun is The Shining. And so every time that Stanley deviates from Stephen King's uh, book is where he's revealing his travails as he made the Apollo moon landings. So um, the, the, the first time that I began to really realize that something was up was is about 58 minutes into The Shining when Danny is playing with his trucks on the floor and there's a very odd pattern in the carpeting and I'd seen that pattern somewhere before and I couldn't remember where and um, so I quickly as I as I had my revelation 2006 as I was watching and I turned off the uh, the uh, uh, DVD, and I typed in, Googled in, you know, Apollo moon landing um, launch pad. Mm -hmm. And I, then I saw the picture of launch pad 39A where Apollo 11 took out and was absolutely stunned to see how close it was to the odd pattern on the carpeting below Danny as he's playing with his trucks in The Shining. Mm -hmm. um, that really got me, I have to say. And I thought, wow, and even the way the trucks in, are situated inside this pattern looks like trucks that are on the launch pad before the launch, filling it up with fuel and getting it all ready, hmm. but didn't have a, a rocket. I was like, okay, so there's a launch pad, and it looks like there's trucks there, but where's the, where's the rocket? And then I hit play on my remote, and the very next thing that happens, of course, is Danny stands up, and as he stands up, we see a rocket on his sweater launching upwards, and the sweater says Apollo 11. Well, you know, by this time, I'm really pretty interested in what I'm watching. And um, Danny starts walking down the carpeting towards the room that he was warned never to go into, room 237. Yeah. At that point, I hit stop again, and I went, why did Kubrick change the number of the room from the book 217 to 237? And then it rang in my head, hey, wait a minute, before the laser telemetry uh, that was done in the late 60s, early 70s, the standard operating mean distance from the Earth to the moon was exactly 237,000 miles. Hmm. I have been forced recently by a critic of mine to come up with science books that use this number. And I want to thank you out there, whoever you are, that was writing all those terrible emails to me because you forced me to do the work. I've now dug up 17 books, science books, geography books, astronomy books, and even Edgar Allan Poe's short stories using the 237,000-mile number. So I know that I'm right. And I know that that's why Kubrick changed the room to 237. 
because Danny is traversing a symbolic 237,000 miles as he goes from the launch pad on the carpeting to inside the room where something mysterious happens to him and he gets beat up by someone. We don't know who. In the movie, they never tell us. Again, yeah. a huge deviation from the Stephen King book. Yeah. So anyway, in the moon room, uh, which is room number. If you look at the tag on the door, it says R O O M and then uh, 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 N O, uh, which is a, you know old European uh, 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 symbol for number. Uh, we can see that the letters room and no make up the room's moon room. We know, uh, I know actually from an aide of Stanley Kubrick that he called the set that he was shooting the moon uh, landings. He called it the moon room. So um, at that point, I think I had it, but the real um, uh, killer actually is the scene where Wendy uh, finds Jack's book that he will not let her read. He's in a room mysteriously writing a book that he will not let her read. It's very important to understand that. Hmm. She breaks into the room when she thinks that he's not there and looks down at the book and starts reading it and realizes that all it is is one sentence replayed over and over, all work and no play make Jack a dull boy. This is not in the movie. Well, um, of course, I hit stop again at this point and I realized that actually the sentence read, a11, i.e. Apollo 11, work and no play makes Jack, who is really Stanley, a dull boy. Jack discovers Wendy is reading this and is very angry about it. And uh, she tells him that they have to leave the Overlook Hotel. Jack will have nothing to do with this. And he says, don't you know the value of a contract? Do you know what I, I've given my word to my employers? Yeah. Do you know? They would do to me if I stop this right now. Do you have any idea what you're talking about? Incredibly revelatory scene. Yeah. No doubt a true conversation between Stanley and his wife Christiana when she discovered what he was really doing. Yeah. And you've got the scene early on where Jack goes to uh, accept the job as the caretaker and he's in the office with the manager, Barry Nelson, and um, you've, you've drawn some parallels there. Uh, you've made the observation that the manager character looks a bit like JFK and behind him he's got a, an American Eagle uh motif on on the shelf and you've also drawn the comparison between the appearance of the jack nicholson character and kubrick himself who by that point was looking a little disheveled and you know far from the the smart former uh, appearance that he used to have and as the movie pr progresses jack kind of grows a beard and he looked quite similar to, to how kubrick was looking at the time so there's some more parallels there isn't there yeah when uh, stanley was actually um all the way up until 2001, he was actually a, a fairly, you know, he was a snappy dresser, but, you know, he wore uh, clean clothes and, and he, had a, he, was, he shaved and he combed his hair. And then somewhere around 1966, 67, something happened. Now, people on the set even said it. He stopped changing his clothes. He would have coffee stain on his shirt that would be on the shirt for two or three weeks, indicating that he had not taken the shirt off. Hmm. Um, he quit showering. Uh, his hair started getting really greasy. He started growing uh, a disheveled beard. And if you look at the Jack Nicholson's character in The Shining, you can also see the same thing going on. He stops changing his clothes. He's got the same uh, 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 a plaid shirt on through the whole last part of the movie. In fact, uh, Nicholson even comments uh, at one time how weird it was to wear the same exact clothes every day for a year. <laughs> and... Um, and then the Barry Nelson character, well, it's very interesting. If you Google uh, John F. Kennedy and, and a toupee, you will discover that John F. Kennedy actually wore a toupee, hmm. which he, believe it or not, he did. And it's pretty obvious once you see it, okay? And it's pretty clear that the Barry Nelson character is wearing a toupee also. Yeah. Shining, and what's amazing about it is it's almost exactly the same exact toupee that Kennedy had. So that begs the question, you know, did um, did the Pentagon and Kennedy see a copy of Doctor Strangelove before November 1963? It's entirely possible that they saw it, you know, right after it was completed in August. 
Did Kennedy see it before, in between the time it was finished and the time he died? And he, you know, did he make the offer? Or is it Kubrick trying to in, in, interject Kennedy into this whole process so we can begin back engineering the entire narrative of NASA? That's the story, I believe. I believe by injecting Kennedy into the story, Kubrick is asking the researcher to go back and look at the history of NASA and realize that in 1961, Kennedy had made a speech saying that NASA had to get to the moon by the end of the decade. Yeah. A completely ridiculous assertion, actually. Why would you want to get there before? You want to get there right. You want to get there safe. You don't want to get there on some kind of arbitrary time period. But I believe what was going on is that, and I know this, uh, at least part of this, if we know this from Freedom of Information uh, documents, Kennedy had taken Marilyn Monroe to look at, quote, the alien stuff, as uh, Marilyn told Dorothy Kilgallen, a journalist, uh, in early 1961, before he had made the speech. So I believe that Kennedy had seen something. I don't know if it's aliens. I'm not going to go that far. Uh, I will just say he saw some high technology that he thought should be released to the world, like possibly free energy machines or something. And he, uh, the Pentagon and the industrial military industrial complex absolutely refused to release this stuff. Uh, uh, over his arguments, and so he cr concocted this whole get to the moon by the end of the decade, thinking that, knowing that they could not get there with standard rocket technology, so he put out this kind of challenge, thinking that eventually NASA and the military industrial complex would have to cough up the real technology and get give it to the world, uh, uh, but he didn't realize that they were going to be so ruthless that they would fake it. Yeah. And in that context, that early scene of Jack uh, talking through the job with, with the manager there can be taken to be highly symbolic. You know, you've got Jack as the caretaker, which if you take that to be Kubrick, the caretaker of the project in hand, and they strike up the deal, the contract, you know, this is what Jack will do for, for the hotel, this is what Kubrick will do for the elites. Uh, highly symbolic there, I feel, in, in that context. Yeah, and he has to, his job is essentially to... Um, I, I believe, of course, the overlook is really symbolic of, of for the United States. It was built on the blood of Indians and graves of Indians, excuse me, and all of the best people stay here. Um, so, you know, that could be America, um, and I think it is. And I believe that there's a, a great scene where uh, Wendy and Danny are running towards the maze out of the front door of the of the overlook, and uh, Wendy says, first person there gets to keep America clean. Well, Jack's job is to keep the overlook clean and make sure that it, even though it's a crumbling edifice, that it stays looking like it is not crumbling. That's his job. Yeah. And that is Kubrick's job, to make sure the crumbling edifice of the United States is not apparent to anyone watching. Yeah, there you go. Following things through then, uh, Kubrick's last movie was, of course, Eyes Wide Shut. And in it, he depicts satanic rituals of the type that we're told the elites routinely engage in. It was filmed, I believe, at a Rothschild mansion, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and, of course, Stanley conveniently died of a heart attack just before the release of the movie. And we hear that 25 minutes of footage or thereabouts were subsequently cut by the studio, which the public has never seen. Uh, and what you do see in, in the public version of Eyes Wide Shut is pretty shocking in terms of the rituals. So it does lead you to wonder what was deemed uh, completely unacceptable for the public to view. Uh, is there anything to suggest foul play in Kubrick's heart attack? And has there been any suggestion that you've come across as to what might have been depicted in this mi missing footage? Well, um, you know, uh, he was uh, he, making films is really hard work uh, physically. Um, it's akin to going into battle or combat. Um, so, uh, I, I mean, I may have just finished a feature film, and I'm telling you, I, I, I went to bed for a week and literally did not get out of bed for a week. And I'm much younger than he was. Um, so could the, making the film have killed him? Oh, yeah, it could have. Um, however, 
The big problem with Stanley's death is that it happened 666 days before January 1st, 2001. And that just bothers me to no end. Wow. I, I don't know. I can't say I wasn't there. I know they can give heart attacks to people. So I know that they could have done it. So um, I don't. I can't answer that. I don't want to be irresponsible enough to say it. But I just find it all highly suspicious. Yeah. And he never lived to see 2001. He never lived to be C-2001, which was going to be the year that he was going to release artificial intelligence, AI, yeah. uh, which was going to be his crowning achievement, and he was going to retire in 2001, by the way. Um, but um, there is another interesting thing, and you can Google in Rothschild Masquerade Party, and I believe it was at the same exact mansion that is featured in Eyes Wide Shut, hmm. the Rothschild child held a party i believe in 1972 um at nathaniel uh, rothschild's house there outside of london and um they did they dressed up very similar to eyes wide shut so one ha- it was all elitist at this party so one has to wonder did stanley go to this party is it possible that yeah. he went to the party and maybe possibly came home with his wife and said you know i'm going to expose this crap well, seems perfectly yep. plausible to me. Certainly does. You know, um, I'm sure he didn't like being told what to do, um, especially by people who were far less intelligent than he was. And I think there was a lot of resentment. Yeah, seems to be the case. I went to a fascinating exhibition, actually, in Rome, uh, probably about seven or eight years ago. And it was all um, props and artifacts and things that were used in Kubrick's movies. Uh, and it was the ape suits from 2001. There was an exhibition on the front screen projection method showing how it was done. There was the, the helmets from uh, a Full Metal Jacket, all kinds of stuff. Did you ever see that exhibition? I did. And it was fascinating. Um uh, especially uh, his books, his logs, uh, his notes, his preparatory notes. Yeah, I was on a panel. You can see the uh, there's an extra in the room in the film room two thirty seven, where I'm on a panel with Leon Vitale, his assistant, um, at the at the um, at the hotel in Colorado. That was the inspiration for The Shining, ironically called the Stanley, and. Um, in, in in the film, in this uh, uh, panel discussion about The Shining, and, and Leon is extremely upset at me and calling me names and saying I'm Satan and all this other nonsense. Uh, I, I showed, I proved to him that he, of course, was nowhere around Stanley during the making of 2001. He didn't join Stanley until 1973 when he played Lord Bullington in Barry Lyndon. And then he became Stanley's assistant. And he finally has to resort in this conference to saying that Stanley Kubrick is a complete idiot uh, and that he had no continuity or sense of continuity. This is the only way that he can defend all the high strangeness going on in The Shining is to say that Kubrick is an idiot. So when I went to see the exhibition, I wanted to find out, is Kubrick an idiot? Maybe Leon Vitale, I mean, he knew him. Maybe he knows more than I know. So I started looking at those books and reading the notes, the preparation notes. I was stunned. It was like reading Da Vinci hmm. or something, like how Leonardo would prepare for something. It was the, the, the detail in the notes was astounding. And I came away saying, there is no way in the world that Stanley Kubrick did anything by accident. Yeah. Okay. So to leave Kubrick alone, then, I just want to move on to Saturn to finish off the conversation, because we touched on this earlier. Uh, Saturn fascinates me in a slightly unsettling, macabre kind of way. It seems to be a planet that's been much discussed, analysed, reflected on in recent times, uh, as people come to these new understandings about... What, what's really going on in the world and, and what we're doing here and all these great truths. Can we just run through a quick history of what Saturn has been said to represent through the ages 
and the various ways in which it's been depicted. Because there's so many ways of symbolising Saturn, isn't there? From black crosses to cubes to all kinds of things. Can we just have a quick potted history of what uh, human society has had to say about Saturn through the ages? Yeah, uh, Saturn, I'm with you on that. I'm totally, completely fascinated by Saturn. I've been following the Cassini program since it started. I find the Cassini program odd that they would have, feel that they needed to send 72 pounds of plutonium uh, blasting off from Florida into space, that this project was so important they would do something so absolutely so dangerous as to do that. Um, and Cassini has brought back the goods, too, especially for insiders, I hear, inside NASA. But, but Saturn, you know, Saturn has held a, an incredible um, fascination with the human race from the beginning. Uh, you know, the electric universe people posit that it was actually the sun of our uh, central sun of our solar system. Yeah. At, that it moved into a planetary rotation after the, another sun came in. Right. I don't know if that's true. It can't be proven, I don't think. But if you take the symbols, symbolism of Saturn, um, he's the grim reaper. Uh, the guy with the blade uh, reaping the souls, which is I, th- I find rather odd. Mm. He's Kronos. Uh, he's time. He's Father Time. Um, Father Christmas. Is, uh, yeah, Father Christmas. He's um, uh, Saturn is the the visible planet, the mo- the longest away visible, most visible planet. So it, it does act as kind of a perimeter to our reality. Um, dictating time in a strange and odd way. Uh, of course, it's represented by a cube in, in history, which is very odd because there's a, a hexagonal pattern, as I said earlier, at the North Pole. How did the people thousand years ago know that there's this kind of cube relationship with, with Saturn? Yeah. I find that very odd. Um, uh, Iapetus, its moon, is uh, jarringly odd and looks constructed, actually. It looks completely artificial. Uh, so uh, Saturn is, I, I believe, the center, the very center nucleus of whatever is really going on in this Illuminati secret society. What it is means clearly i do not know i know that they themselves are fascinated with it and that's why they sent cassini there uh and i really wish i knew everything that cassini has found because i'll bet you it is absolutely brain bending yeah no doubt and a lot of researchers say that things that we've generally taken to think of as referring to our sun the sun could actually be referring to the dark sun of Saturn instead, uh, from sort of halos that you see uh, around saints and uh, the sun rising and the sun's rays kind of in buildings, architecture and such. Uh, All of this could actually be referring to Saturn and all along we've been misled into thinking that ancient cultures were talking about the, the sun. Would you go along with that? Yeah, I, I do go along with that. I, I, I don't. Again, I don't know if scientifically it's true, but um, uh, it, it is odd because in the Kabbalah, the Jewish mysticism, uh, uh, you can you can actually replace Saturn with the sun. It's allowed. Saturn is, it can, it, it, Tippereth is the sun symbol within the tree of life. And it's okay, according to the Kabbalists, to put Saturn there and, and interchange sun and Saturn, which I find odd and strange. Why would that be? Yeah. And, and, and Kubrick, of course, touches on this in 2001. So, um, I, and, and again, another thing that's interesting about Saturn is uh, J.R.R. Tolkien's work, uh, Lord of the Rings, which is ostensibly about um, a dictator trying to take over the world uh, named Sauron, um, who has an eye that can see everything that's going on. And Sauron is the Lord of the Rings. What's weird is that eye looks very closely to the eye that's on the southern pole of Saturn. Yeah. And you have to wonder... Tolkien got into the medieval library at Oxford. In fact, he could only only one that could read the books. And he was telling C.S. Lewis and his friends, you know, that Lord of the Rings was going to be the true history of Europe. That it, you know, the the hobbits were the Irish and the 
elves were the Nords and uh, the um, Germans were the um, the uh, the dwarfs and all of that and and that that, that there really was a war six thousand five hundred years before he wrote the book that's detailed inside the books that he was reading at Oxford and you know I believe that he was trying to tell us that Sargon the original conqueror of Mesopotamia and the creator of civilizations on earth was actually the first Saturnian and that Sargon, i.e. Sauron, is the Lord of the Rings. And Sargon, 6,000 years ago, established the Saturnian societies here on Earth. Yeah. And I can't help noticing that the name Saturn is very similar to Satan and also the Egyptian uh, character of Set in Egyptian mythology. Uh, and... I'm wondering if when we're talking about Satanism and you hear people making references to Satanism, it's really Saturnism and that Satan is symbolic of the planet Saturn and that when you get Satanic rituals, what's really happening is these rituals are channeling the energy of Saturn. Uh, I don't know how how, how do you feel about that. Uh, Bingo, you win. Okay, Satan, Saturn, it's just a little too obvious to me. Yeah, it is. And, and, and uh, again, you know, uh, the way that, you know, we're binded by these rings, you know, that the rings that bind us. And Saturn is the last visible planet, and it makes a ring around us. And, in, in, and it's a 30-year cycle of this ring. And, um, and this ring binds us to, our, to time. Um, that's that's what that's the element that we're actually being is being used to enslave us by the Illuminati. Linear time yeah. is a weapon of choice, and so we are caught in linear time, which is not natural time. And it's all done for the convenience of the Illuminati so that we can have airports and, you know, we can go to lunch at the same time and businesses and corporations and cities and uh, politicians and everything all need to work off of linear time. So we're trapped in linear time. But linear time is not real. It's fake. The time is, 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 is uh, relative. Hmm. Uh, Einstein said two minutes sitting on a hot stove will seem like 10 years, while uh, 10 years talking to a beautiful woman will seem like two minutes. <laughs> so time is relative. It's not linear. Uh, one second can be an hour long or one second can be a tenth of a second long, depending on the situation. Yeah. If you've got a bullet burning in your gut, believe me, one second is going to feel like eternity. So, um, you know, we've been fooled by this. It's been done to expedite us uh, as slaves. And uh, we, uh, and right now, I hope that the linear system of time is beginning to decay and we're going back to what I call nonlinear time, um, polychronic uh, beings, which is what we were before Sargon conquered us 6,000 years ago. Sargon instituted time, calendars, day clocks, sundials, and this was all done so that he could successfully run his armies and conquer the world. And so we can see that the Saturnians are the ones behind linear time, which is why Saturn is identified as Kronos or Father Time or the Grim Reaper because these all have to do with time and time is the great enslaving agent of the Illuminati. They, they, they use fear of death to control us. Yeah, so it's time and aging and you've got Saturn depicted as the old man with the white beard which sort of brings to mind this idea of aging as, as linear time progresses. And meanwhile, uh, the population has been conditioned to think that Satan, when we hear about Satan, is a depiction of the devil, this demonic entity, this singular uh, demonic entity, which people call the devil or Lucifer. And, you know, it's all throwing people off the track as to what's really going on, I feel, so that they're not looking in the right place. I, I totally agree. And uh, uh, so it, it's sad that we have to... Um, we can't use the word Saturnist. We have to use the word Satanist because I really think Saturnist is a much more clear uh, description of who we're dealing with. Yeah. And, you know, when I look at 
images of Saturn, it kind of sends a chill down my spine when I think about all the things that have been done in its name, you know, all these rituals and all these sacrifices and all these horrific things that have happened in, in humanity. Is it all being done uh, to connect with the energy of this planetary body? You know, it just really chills me and, and freaks me out to, to, to look at that planet because there's just something about it. Well, also, if you go to the sequel to 2001 A Space Odyssey, written by Arthur C. Clarke, 2010, um, and you, again, switch Jupiter with Saturn. Uh, so, uh, you know, Clarke had it be Saturn in 2001, but in the sequel, he inexplicably switches it back to Jupiter, okay, which was a very odd thing. But if you don't do the switch and you read the sequel to 2001, um, as it being Saturn and not Jupiter, then you can see that there is a second sun that is igniting. The monolith in the book, and I think the movie, is igniting the planet and turning it into a second sun. It's like jaw-dropping if, when you realize it. Yeah. And there's a lot of speculation on the Internet that the 72 pounds of plutonium that Cassini took to Saturn is actually a nefarious plan to ignite Saturn after Cassini is all finished with what it's doing. Mm. Yeah, fascinating stuff. How do you feel humanity can break the spell of the hold that Saturn seems to have over us then? You know, try, trying to uh, stay optimistic and positive about where we're headed. Uh, is this something we're going to see happen at any point in the near future, do you feel? And what is it going to take to uh, break free of this influence? Well, I've heard from my insiders that uh, Ed Snowden ha is going to release a document that has all of the names, addresses, phone numbers, and contact info for uh, all the international bankers. And they are deathly afraid that this is going to happen, and that mobs are going to come to their house and pull them out. This is what they're afraid of, that mobs are going to pull them out of the house and Robespierre them, which could happen, by the way. That would be something, wouldn't it? Yeah, I prefer that we take a more mature and responsible approach to this whole thing and we don't do what they would do, which is what I just described because that's what they would do. I, I, I postulate that what we need to do is simply say that you're under house arrest, you can't use your money anymore, uh, you can't go outside, outside of your property anymore. Um, you can't use the internet. You can't use the phone. You can't use the mail system. Uh, we will give you food and give your wife and family food and comfort until you're dead. And, uh, 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 but, and that we should just end it like that. I don't want this thing to go into a French Revolution, Robespierre thing, but I think that the internet is waking everybody up so fast that this could happen. It could just be 100,000 angry people pulling people out of their houses and no trials and, mm. uh, you know, and, and hanging them or guillotining them or whatever, and I'm really kind of hoping that we don't go down that road. I think these people need to have justice served, yes, but I think we don't want to go down the road that they would go down, yeah. which is a road of violence. And I think in, as hard as this is for most people, I think we have to find some way to forgive them and, um, and make sure that they never, ever exercise an iota of power ever again. Yeah. And we've also got these stories of the common law trials, which are imminent of the Queen and of the Pope of the Catholic Church, which, of course, is... Uh, uh, a cover for more Satanism or Saturnism, uh, just dressed up as the Roman Catholic Church. So that that's a kind of burning story at the moment, which most people aren't aware of because it's not made the mainstream media. You've got to read the alternative media to even be aware that you've got this guy, Matt Taylor, in the UK, a former uh, police officer and you've got kevin annett of the ispcc in canada that's trying to bring these trials about but that seems to be an indication of the fact that at least on a, a very limited level uh people have had enough of this power structure these elites this control system and they want it to come to an end it's all quite encouraging really even though it's at very early stages i feel yeah well there's an interesting side story to that. I've been going around for like 10 years telling people that I think that there's a separate 
race of humans that has occupied the planet with us for a long time. I call them crypto terrestrials. Uh, just I've seen a lot of evidence, talked to a lot of military people who told me this, that there are these tall, like eight foot uh, tall uh, humanoid aliens, not aliens, they're from Earth, and with super white skin. They're called the tall whites. Well, Paul Hellyer, the former Canadian defense minister, has come out publicly recently and said that the tall whites are controlling the United States, okay, which is kind of an interesting thing for a guy like that to say. What I found out about Paul Hellyer is that he's also in the privy, Queen Elizabeth's council, uh, uh, advice council. He's a second oldest ranking member on the privy, Prince Philip being the oldest ranking member of the privy. So why would a member of the privy come out and say the tall whites are actually running the world? Hmm. A couple days ago, Karen Hughes, who used to work with the World Bank, came out and said the tall whites are actually running the Vatican. So now I've got two highly credible people saying that I've been right all these years. So I, I have to ask myself, why would this be happening and I think that the elites, Queen Elizabeth, the bankers, corporate people, I think they know they're about to get hung with this stuff. And they're either copying the truth and saying that they're just following orders from these other beings, or they're making the whole thing up and just using what I've been saying as an excuse so that we don't go after them. I don't yeah. know which. Yeah, who knows? Fascinating either way. Mind-blowing stuff, Jay. Uh, we're on the same page with so much of it as well. Really great to talk to you. Just before we conclude then, do you want to remind people where they can go to find you online, your web addresses, how they can get hold of your films and such? Yeah, um, you can read all my free articles on jaywidener.com, J-A-Y-W-E-I-D-N-E-R.com. You can see all my movies, including my two Kubrick's Odyssey movies. The third one will be out very soon which is going to be a serious mind blower. Um, and that's at sacredmysteries.com, sacredmysteries, with an S, dot com. And um, I have a new feature film coming out called Shasta with uh, Neil Donald Walsh playing uh, Count St. Germain, which I think people are going to really like. And all this stuff that we've been talking about is inside the, my movie, too. And this third Kubrick movie, we're looking at, what, this year sometime, summer maybe? Within a couple months, I hope to have it done. Okay. All right, great. Jay, thanks for your time today. Thanks, Mark.